In her enlightening exploration, Drive, Subhasri Kalita Talakdar, an assistant professor in the Department of Assamese at Handy Girls College, Guwahati, Assam, India, delves into the intricacies of Mamang Day's poignant work, Stupid Cupid, through the lens of subaltern studies. Dr. Talakdar illuminates the often overlooked northeastern region of India, portraying it as a remote enclave, distinct in its geography, customs, culture, and rituals. The region's denizens, visually resembling the Chinese, find themselves grappling with a sense of insecurity and neglect when attempting to assimilate into the mainstream fabric of Delhi and other metropolitan cities. The narrative unravels against the backdrop of the post-colonial era, a time marked by the bitter residues of imperial rule. Drawing inspiration from Gayatri Spivak's provocative question, Can the subaltern speak? Posed in 1985, Drive, Talakdar sheds light on the marginalized voices of the Northeast's hill tribes. The descriptions of these regions, she argues, have historically been shaped by the colonizers' perspectives, what Edward Said aptly terms, fantasies. Entering the terrain of post-colonial studies, as charted by Edward Said's seminal work, Orientalism, in 1978, Drive. Talakdar underscores the discursive component of colonialism. The dawn of the 20th century witnessed a global shift, characterized by the rapid movement, displacement, and resettlement of people, a phenomenon intricately woven into Mamang Day's novel, Stupid Cupid. In this literary tapestry, Day's narrative becomes a profound reflection of the contemporary search for identity and roots in a world metamorphosed into a global village. Dr. Subhasri Kalita Talakdar's insightful analysis not only amplifies the significance of Mamang Day's work but also contributes to the broader discourse on post-colonial studies and the quest for identity in our ever-evolving world. The ebb and flow of human existence often entail transitions from one place to another, a phenomenon integral to the daily lives of individuals. In India, this constant movement across states is spurred by a myriad of reasons, be they historical, socio-economic, cultural, or deeply personal, collectively encapsulated as migration. Yet, within the folds of this migration, a profound sense of homelessness often takes root, and the experiences amassed by these wanderers are far from uniformly positive, rather, they manifest as intensely bitter narratives. Such narratives find resonance in Mamang Day's novel, Stupid Cupid. The novel unveils a new cast of characters primarily hailing from the tribes of Arunachal Pradesh, who, in their pursuit of a tranquil existence, transition from the hills to the bustling cities, seeking emancipation from the clutches of hegemonic power. Adna, the narrator, becomes a poignant embodiment of this migratory journey, departing from her verdant homeland in Edenagar, Arunachal Pradesh, after completing her hotel management course in Guwahati and Calcutta, to settle in New Delhi. Before her migration, Adna harbored a dream of cultivating a haven for peaceful interactions, a meeting place where men, women, lovers, and friends could freely exchange their emotions, a common practice among the hill tribes. However, upon attempting to secure accommodation in Delhi, she encounters a series of humiliating situations, as the city dwellers perceive her actions as sinful. Adna emerges as a broad-minded and progressive character, inheriting a property from her late aunt, which she envisions transforming into a delightful abode named, Four Seasons. Her stroke of luck lies in possessing a bungalow in Delhi, a gift from her aunt, a crucial asset given her modest background, which might otherwise have hindered her ability to secure property in the city. Mamang Dai crafts Adna's character with deliberate care, allowing her to seamlessly navigate city life without significant impediments. In this urban landscape, Yo-Yo, Adna's cousin, emerges as a steadfast ally, offering unwavering support. Yo-Yo shoulders the challenges of managing the agency and attending to customers. Adna acknowledges this reliance on Yo-Yo, stating, I relied on Yo-Yo to deal with workmen. They were young men like him, and came to work wearing thick rubber slippers, baggy clothes and packed caps, Dai 32. Four Seasons, under Adna's stewardship, transforms into a sanctuary for peace enthusiasts. For Adna, the space holds a nuanced perspective on relationships, where two individuals seeking to rediscover a lost intensity find solace. Adultery, in her view, doesn't reside in a meeting of like-minded souls, rather, it could be a reunion of old friends. Adna articulates this sentiment, asserting, it is not quite adultery, I had said at the time. Even now, I did not see a meeting of like-minded souls as adulterous behavior. They could even be old friends. Sometimes two people may just want some time to see if they can rediscover a lost intensity, die too. In the enchanting realm of Mamang Days, Stupid Cupid, Adna finds herself entangled in the complex web of love, 
a love that unfolds with an unspoken intensity for a man whose name remains veiled in the narrative's discretion. Their initial encounter weaves Adna into the tapestry of a dreamy world saturated with love, romance, liberty, and ecstasy, all nestled within the bustling streets of Delhi. In the confines of her emotions, Adna chooses to refer to her beloved as a friend, a title that belies the depth of her affection. Together, they carve out a haven of happiness and comfort. However, the nature of Adna's relationship becomes a canvas upon which the deeply entrenched stereotypes and fixed tags associated with Northeastern women are painted. Often perceived as flexible and, perhaps unfairly, immoral, these labels cast a shadow on the experiences of women from the Northeast when they traverse the vast landscapes of metropolitan cities. Adna, seemingly impervious to these stereotypes, revels in a sense of freedom and independence, embracing the opportunity to break free from the constraints of her native origins. Her boyfriend from Delhi, a pivotal figure in this chapter of her life, abruptly departs without offering a reasonable explanation. His proclamation of heading to Canada leaves Adna in solitude, grappling with the abrupt void created by his departure. Yet, Adna's confidant, Green, becomes the harbinger of truth in this narrative. Green unveils a reality obscured by the shadows of ambiguity, suggesting that the boyfriend's journey to Canada might not be in the company of his wife but rather with a new companion, a revelation that thrusts Adna into the harsh light of an unexpected and painful truth. In the intricate narrative of Stupid Cupid, Mamang Dai introduces Mareb, the inaugural caller to Four Seasons. Mareb emerges as a woman who defies societal conventions, a free-spirited soul entangled in a complex web of relationships. Despite being married to Diet and blessed with a daughter, her insatiable desires draw her into the orbit of Rohit. The burgeoning closeness between Mareb and Rohit blossoms into a deep friendship, prompting them to connect with Adna's agency, ultimately forging a bond with Adna herself. Mareb's decision to relinquish the confines of a socially prescribed happy life with Diet underscores her liberated mindset. Dai paints Mareb as a remarkably open-minded woman, challenging traditional norms. While Dayud's remarriage is accepted without much societal upheaval, Merp's connection with Rohit is swiftly stamped with the pejorative label of adultery. The narrative lens then shifts to Rita, another tribal woman navigating the cosmopolitan landscape of Delhi while pursuing her studies. Unacquainted with Adna or Ja initially, Rita's friendship with Yo-Yo serves as an introduction to the vibrant world encapsulated by Adna. Dai, in a positive portrayal of the evolving dynamics in the Northeast, illustrates the diverse tapestry of tribes and districts. She articulates this through Adna's perspective. Rita was from a different tribe from another district, and neither John nor I knew anything about her. It is a big state, I told my friend, and for most of our history, the different tribes had never even interacted with each other properly, even if they lived in the next valley. It was only now that young people like Yo-Yo and Rita were meeting in schools and colleges, Dai 88. In this multifaceted exploration of relationships and societal norms, Dai introduces a cast of women who navigate the intricacies of their desires, friendships, and identities within the backdrop of a changing Northeast. Each character contributes to the mosaic of experiences, challenging stereotypes and underscoring the complexities inherent in the quest for autonomy and self-expression. In Mamangai's intricate narrative, the introduction of Amin adds another layer to the diverse tapestry of female characters in Stupid Cupid. Amin, Adna's close friend, brings a unique perspective, hailing originally from Jammu but having grown up in Shillong due to her father's association with ONGC. Notably, Amin doesn't grapple with the difficulties often associated with tribal features, challenging stereotypes surrounding physical appearance. Amin takes a bold stance on the societal norm of monogamous marriages prevalent in Indian culture. She asserts that marriage lacks intensity and justifies her choice to explore love outside its confines as a quest for rediscovery, looking to rediscover something, die too. However, the tranquility of Adna's world is shattered when Amin becomes the victim of a tragic murder. The laborers of Amin's bungalow, seeking money and finding Adna absent, turn to Amin. When she refuses, they take advantage of her husband's absence and commit the heinous act. Amin's untimely death leaves Adna in shock, instilling a fear that prompts her decision to leave her apartment and return to her homeland. Mareb, despite her apparent blessings in having Dayat as her husband, also grapples with challenges. The narrative subtly suggests that, except for Ja, the female characters depicted by Mamang Day fail to experience true independence and freedom. Ja, having faced the tragedy of
Losing her baby at the age of 18 and enduring abuse from her husband, escapes her home to pursue a career in journalism in Delhi. The elders in Adna's family express concerns about Adna's ability to navigate the complexities of a big city like Delhi, given the prevalent news of rape, murders, and cruelty. The elders' fear reflects the broader societal apprehensions about the safety and well-being of women in urban landscapes. From our hometowns news would reach us about family get-togethers and picnics, and the elders asked us when we would return. Wetnuthis was their way of saying. They hoped we would marry and settle down with good, local men, because how would anyone meet the right person away from home? They followed the news about shocking murders and the cruelty of Delhi, which was reported daily, Dai 14. In Mamangdai's exploration of the cultural landscape and challenges faced by individuals from the northeast in Stupid Cupid, Adna astutely recognizes the stark differences that set the region apart, asserting that the northeast is a different country altogether, Dai 13. Despite the increasing presence of people from Mizoram, Meghalaya, Nagaland, Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Manipur, Sikkim, and other parts of the country in the city, challenges persist at the grassroots level when assimilating into the mainstream. Ja, Adna's cousin, shares a poignant experience that reflects the difficulties faced by northeastern individuals in Delhi. An encounter with a Delhiite woman who shouts derogatory remarks highlights the prejudice and ignorance prevalent in the city. Ja vehemently asserts her Indian identity, challenging the woman's perception and defending her origins, emphasizing the broader issue of acceptance and rejection faced by the Northeast community in Delhi. In essence, Mamang Dai lays bare the bitter truth that Delhi, despite being the capital, does not guarantee security for people from the Northeast. Through various instances, Dai illustrates how issues of acceptance and rejection are not confined to a specific location but are part of a broader strategy to maintain and establish hegemonic power. She sheds light on the exploitation perpetuated by the central government in the name of developing the Northeast, unveiling the complex dynamics at play. Day's narrative underscores the cultural disparities between tribal and non-tribal communities. Despite these differences, she advocates for a pan-Indian nationalism, emphasizing the need for representation of frontier regions in the mainland. The existence of customary laws in the hills allowing polygamy may seem shocking in Delhi, just as the idea of buying a water bottle in Delhi shocks Ja. Through, stupid Cupid, Mamang Dai consistently communicates the message that overcoming capitalist exploitation and cultural rejection requires adequate representation of frontier regions in the broader fabric of the nation. Resha Barman, an assistant professor in the Department of English at APC Roy Government College, Siliguri, explores the theme of women and marginality in Mamang Day's novel, Stupid Cupid, in her article titled, Creating New Borderlines, Women and Marginality in Mamang Day's Novel, Stupid Cupid, published in 2009 by Penguin Books India. Day's novel, set in Delhi, transcends geographical boundaries to portray women from the eastern Himalayan region, spanning from Darjeeling and Siliguri to the Terai region and up to Arunachal Pradesh. The narrative in, Stupid Cupid, delves into the evolving image of womanhood in modern India, juxtaposing the influence of global metropolitan culture against the backdrop of perpetually neglected rural culture. The women in the novel grapple with various oppressions based on race, ethnicity, and gender in both urban and rural spaces, forming a common bond in their struggles, irrespective of their origins. Barman draws on Simone de Beauvoir's concept of to be, a woman in a dynamic sense, emphasizing the continuous process of becoming, unlike other marginalized groups who are consistently positioned as, other. Women, as, absolute others, lack a distinct past, history, or religion, living intertwined with males through residence, housework, economic conditions, and social standing. The article challenges the male-dominated construct of human history, highlighting the often overlooked fates of women. While tribal societies worldwide are praised for their egalitarian treatment of women, the heterogeneity of tribes in India's northeast is frequently forgotten. The misconception of higher status for women in the region is dispelled through discussions on education, freedom, and authority, pointing to the underlying inequality. Examining customary laws, Barman cites Drive. Mrs. Gina Shankham's study to reveal the pervasive gender inequality in northeast India. Despite the perception of matrilineal societies, customary laws in patrilineal societies relegate women to a less significant position, with identity and responsibility shifting to the husband's clan after marriage. Mamang Dai in her novel Stupid Cupid, portrays the traditional gendering of spaces in these societies, where women derive meaning and happiness from familial association. 
The tension between individualism and relationality among women is evident, with societal norms restricting their well-being, dreams, hobbies, and access to knowledge. The novel illustrates the sacrifices made by women for their families, exemplified by Merb's mother, who adheres to prescribed gender roles but experiences a lack of depth in her relationship with her husband. Despite her dedication, societal constraints limit her access to various spaces, including her maternal home. The article underscores the nuanced complexities of women's experiences in Northeast India, challenging prevailing stereotypes and highlighting the need for a more comprehensive understanding of their struggles and identities. The excerpt you've provided discusses various aspects related to the changing social, political, and economic landscape in India, particularly in the context of Mamang Day's novel, Stupid Cupid. Here's a summary and rephrasing. The narrative criticizes the protagonist's immediate remarriage after his wife's death, emphasizing his insensitivity and lack of commitment to family. Drawing from Moirangtham Tinishauri Devi's study on adolescent girls in Manipur, it highlights the challenges faced by young girls in the region, including societal restrictions and exploitation. The discussion shifts to the evolving realities of contemporary India since the late 20th century, marked by social, political, and economic transformations. The concept of a post-post-colonial generation, untouched by colonial experiences, is introduced, and the impact of global capitalism, synonymous with neoliberal globalization, on India's economic policies is explored. The country's shift from a socialist economy to a neoliberal one in 1991 under Finance Minister Manmohan Singh is highlighted, noting the subsequent changes in social dynamics. The focus then turns to Mamang Day's novel, Stupid Cupid, positioning it as a representative work of a new generation of indigenous writers grappling with India's imperial future. The narrative suggests a convergence of indigenous and mainstream literature in contemporary neoliberal urban spaces, challenging the previous separation of these literary domains. The paper's primary objectives are outlined, including an analysis of the novel's portrayal of neoliberal subjectivity empowering Northeast migrant women, the representation of the expanding city as a breeding ground for criminality and its impact on women's safety, and the depiction of ecosystem depletion in Northeast India in the context of post-liberalization India, correlated with the repression of women. Overall, the discussion emphasizes the interconnectedness of literature and societal changes, using Mamang Day's novel as a lens to explore the complex dynamics of contemporary India. The notion of neoliberal subjectivity, evolving from mere economic policies into a lifestyle, plays a significant role in Mamang Day's novel, Stupid Cupid. This new mode of subjectivity is characterized by traits such as self-care, self-responsibility, individualism, a rejection of community, the ability to manipulate surroundings, entrepreneurial skills, and risk management. Derived from 19th-century liberalism, which prioritizes freedom through private property rights and an unregulated market, neoliberalism differs in its extension of subjectivity to previously excluded citizens, notably highlighted in the experiences of indigenous women. The goal of neoliberal subjectivity is to encompass all citizens as ideal subjects for the market. In the novel, exemplified by the protagonist Adna, women from marginalized communities embrace migration and exile as a means of liberation from rural patriarchal oppression. Adna's journey from a small northeast village to Delhi symbolizes her escape from oppressive structures, reflecting her status as a self-made individual. Educated in hotel management in Guwahati and Kolkata, Adna takes charge of her life and well-being, acquiring her aunt's bungalow in Delhi and establishing the unconventional, Four Seasons, Guest House, also serving as a love agency. Adna's decision to transform the bungalow into a love agency challenges societal norms, eliciting objections and underlining prevailing gender stereotypes. Despite facing societal prejudice, Adna, a diehard romantic, takes risks by delaying marriage to explore possibilities in love and career. Her relationship with a married man from the mainstream community adds layers to her character. Moreover, Adna assumes the role of an entrepreneurial godmother, providing employment opportunities to underprivileged relatives and individuals from the urban periphery, thereby challenging the underbelly of urban space. In essence, Mamang Day's Stupid Cupid portrays how neoliberal subjectivity empowers marginalized individuals, especially indigenous women, enabling them to assert agency confront societal norms, and navigate their paths within a dynamically changing social and economic landscape. Beyond Adna, another exemplar of neoliberal subjectivity is Mezikinla, also known as Green. Residing in the urban landscape, she independently manages a thriving business. 
Green exercises her autonomy by selecting the type of man with whom she shares her life and room. Engaging in diverse activities such as volunteering for a drug rehabilitation center and organizing cultural events to raise funds, Green prioritizes substantial tasks over self-beautification. Her multitasking prowess reflects an ever-green heart, symbolizing her dedication to addressing the incomplete connections between the center and the periphery. Green's observations, such as, everything is slipping out of our hands. There is strife and there are drugs, underscore the deep-rooted issues affecting the region's youth. Neoliberal policies, opening national borders for the free flow of capital and goods, inadvertently allowed drugs and heroin to proliferate. The region, already grappling with political conflict and unemployment, witnessed a surge in purposelessness among the populace, with men succumbing to drugs and corruption. Amid the state versus community conflict spanning much of the latter half of the 20th century, men withdrew from civic life, prompting women to form civil societies. Women like Green assumed novel roles, negotiating with the formidable power of the state machinery and transforming their lives and identities. The heightened political conflict acted as a catalyst for gender equality, liberating women from patriarchal constraints and fostering unity among multi-ethnic women. Green, residing in her Meroli apartment in Delhi, maintained open doors for people from her hometown. Her unwavering commitment to her community positioned her as an entrepreneur, godmother, who, at every opportunity, affectionately declared, nothing like our own people, A. Eh? Green's energetic involvement in planning consignments and trading items of immense traditional significance showcased her adaptation to global consumer culture facilitated by neoliberalism. The narrative introduces Mareb, who, having witnessed her mother's sacrifices, defied social taboos to challenge her tyrannical father and escape a monotonous life with a politically obsessed husband. Relocating the entire family to Delhi in pursuit of neoliberal progress, Mareb embodies the true, city woman, as described by her husband. Despite her extramarital affair, her desire to spread love and happiness necessitates a nuanced exploration of her intentions. Mareb's bold choices reflect a quest for a different life, epitomizing the complexities of individual agency within the changing landscape of neoliberal India. Dai vividly portrays Delhi not only as an elite residential and commercial hub within the main city but also highlights the gentrification extending to lavish resorts just outside, complete with amenities like swimming pools, manicured lawns, and well-maintained gyms. These resorts, frequented by affluent individuals like Amin and Anna's friend, represent the transformation of large rural or semi-rural lands in previously, undeveloped, villages into hubs catering to a money-spinning generation. However, the untold aspect of this story is the severe encroachment on agricultural lands and the gradual displacement of farmers by the urban elite accompanying the conversion of rural areas into spaces of elite consumption. The development of the industrial zone in the Trans-Yamuna area, where Rohit's father establishes his son's office in anticipation of economic prosperity, also brings misfortune to marginalized urban poor like Sheila and her auto rickshaw driver husband living on the other side of the Yamuna, for whom the city was very cruel. Chatterjee's perspective on post-1990s development in big cities emphasizes a shift away from the urban core towards infrastructure improvement to facilitate high technology and new service industries. Consequently, the new metropolis becomes globally connected but locally disconnected from large sections of its population deemed functionally unnecessary and potentially socially or politically disruptive. The notion of gentrification in urban spaces centralizes the exclusion of the urban core, often driven to criminality and desperation. The narrative subtly alludes to the contrast between the posh surroundings where Adna lives and the squalid narrow lane just behind. Adna's belief that the presence of diplomats in her vicinity guarantees her safety underscores the state, as the neoliberal nexus of power, Nandi creating conducive and safe conditions for the market while pushing the urban poor to the margins of elite society, resulting in the polarization of urban spaces. Excluded and deemed unproductive, the urban poor become perceived as dangerous, leading to Questions about the safety of women in the city. Adna's boyfriend serves as a reminder of this precarious situation, highlighting the complex dynamics shaped by neoliberal policies and their impact on the urban landscape. Merb's father belonged to the cadre of businessmen and local entrepreneurs engaged in multicore deals. His tactics involved hosting lavish parties for corrupt politicians and wealthy individuals, providing access to lucrative deals. Engaging in extensive construction projects, he deployed heavy machinery like excavators and bulldozers across the Himalayas, causing widespread ecological damage. 
Merp's initial escape to Delhi as a literature student reflected her dream of independence from this suffocating environment. However, her subsequent return and tumultuous love marriage to a local man named Dayad had deeper motivations. Mareb sought to undo the ecological harm inflicted by her father's relentless pursuit of wealth. During what was meant to be her final trip from Delhi to bid farewell to her father, she encountered a natural disaster, a torrential rain and mudslide that destroyed the road he had constructed. In this crisis, Mareb felt a profound solidarity with nature, sensing it conspiring against her father's tyranny. During this challenging period, she met Dayad, an engineer actively involved in politics and known for opposing government plans to dam the river. Dayud's impressive personality and commitment to saving the river resonated with Mareb, leading them to fall in love and eventually marry. However, Mareb's subsequent disillusionment with the marriage stemmed from the failure of their shared ideal, as the river was eventually dammed possibly the Tista, given Mareb and Dayud's connection to the region known as the Chicken Neck. Facing the disappointment of the cause they championed, Mareb returned to her former city. For her, the city held the promise of deliverance and the potential to provide the different life she had always desired, signaling a turning point in her quest for independence and fulfillment. In conclusion, the complex social dynamics of the 21st century world raised debates about the impacts of globalization, especially concerning the migration of women from the northeast to cities. While it may seem that moving to urban areas allows these women to challenge patriarchy and overcome marginalization, the reality presents newer forms of oppression and challenges related to identity and citizenship. Adna and Merb's experiences in love underscore the disillusionment faced by women in the city. The men they love are often only interested in secretive affairs, raising questions about the genuineness of relationships. Racism, particularly against Northeast migrant women, plays a significant role in their urban experience. Mainstream Indian men may discriminate between mainstream Indian women and Northeast migrant women, perpetuating stereotypes that label them as promiscuous and easily available. The vulnerability of women migrants is evident in the fact that they carry self-defense tools, reflecting the dangers they face in the city. Beneath the surface of tolerance, intolerance prevails, as the periphery becomes a target for abuse based on their otherness. Duncan McDewey Ra's study emphasizes the unique discrimination faced by Northeast migrants in Delhi, marked by physical features that differentiate them from the Indian mainstream, leading to doubts about nationality and citizenship. Despite these challenges, the indomitable spirit of these women enables them to survive and even thrive under impossible circumstances. Mamang Day's narrative captures their fighting spirit, highlighting their determination to claim their share in the country's transition to urban modernity. The women from the periphery emerge as fiercely independent and wise individuals who navigate life's uncertainties with a positive attitude. Adna's decision to return to the city, albeit with caution, signifies her growth and ability to shape her own decisions in the pursuit of a fulfilling life. In the face of adversity, these women assert their presence and resilience, contributing to the evolving narrative of urban life in post-independence India.